Hi, I'm Sean Armstrong. I'm here today to teach you about Electrification 101 in pursuit of a cleaner, quieter, less expensive, safer lifestyle. So briefly, I'll introduce myself. Um, I began in 1995 at a green building demonstration house at Humboldt State University in Humboldt County, California. And I've spent my entire professional career continuing to be involved in there, seeing the cutting edge. Um, at the time, we were making our own biodiesel. We had a big solar array, we had a wind turbine in the backyard, we had pedal-powered uh, blenders and computers and TVs. Um, from there, I became a high school science teacher, did that for a few years, but really wanted to follow my passion in green building. So I went to a large general contractor and affordable housing development company. And I spent six years there learning how to do professional construction cost estimation, uh, plan development, construction administration. And then in 2011, started my own consulting firm with Michael Winkler. It's called Redwood Energy. Um, we've got like 15 staff now. And we help out developers and we teach on how to build all electric. Okay, we're gonna do a little bit of story time here. We're gonna do a session called From Reagan to Schwarzenegger, From Horses to Horsepower. Uh, this is a history of electrification in the United States. So starting in the 1800s, we had a horse boom. It was the heyday of horses. There was 27 million horses in the United States at the turn of the last century. But everyone acknowledged they were a problem. Horses were left on the streets in New York City. There's about 500 horses a year left on the streets of New York City that had to be cleaned up because they caused typhoid. They caused a variety of communicable diseases. The horses that were in the streets left behind huge piles of poo. People would actually hire helpers to let them cross the street through the mounds of horse poop with a shovel. People would shovel it out of the way for you. And horses were left lying. Um, that phrase, you can't beat a dead horse, that's how people actually treated horses. They get so frustrated with them, they would kill them. And that was the foundation of the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. What was happening in New York City? Horses naturally lived 30 years. In New York City, their average life was three years. They were left out in the snow. As the policies in New York City started to change, where they made it illegal for horses to go on certain streets because they disrupt, say, the city council meetings, or they required everyone have a garage to put the horse in in the winter so they wouldn't die outside. Horses became very expensive, and that was actually one of the incentives for the beginning of the electric cars. In 1894, we see the first commercially available electric vehicle. It was called the Electrobat, and they would race it against gas cars, five mile long races, and it would win over and over. It was such a successful car that it was the basis for one of the first cab driving businesses in New York City. In the early 1900s, there were 600 of them on the road. Pedro and Henry took their creation to the ultimate proving ground, the hectic streets of New York City, where they ended up part of the Electric Vehicle Company, the first cab company of its kind in New York and the world. The Electrobat was a hit. There were hundreds of them zipping around Midtown. They had a battery station on Broadway. People loved them because you didn't end up covered in soot. However, electric cars were almost twice the price of their combustion counterparts, and they had a limited range. In 1899, we see another milestone of electric vehicles. It was La Jamais Content, its nickname meant the never satisfied. And it was the first car in the world to get to 60 miles per hour. Right around when Reagan was born, 1911, we see a really exponential growth in vehicles in the United States. As you can see from this illustration, it takes about 15 years to go from zero to hero, any sort of technology. You can see it with vehicles, electric and gas stoves, refrigerators, air conditioners. Around 1934 is when we see the United States starting to invest in rural electrification. In 1935, REA is born. 90% of all American farms without light or power. The cities are lighted, the country still in the dark. Lights up, 1936, 26 REA systems, 7,500 farm families like Bill Parkinson's get light. 1937, lights up, there are 122 systems now, power and light for 43,000 farm families. Lights up for Mississippi and Ohio. Lights up north 
south, east, west. 1939, 548 systems, 435,000 families and other users, and many more soon to come on the lines. Lights up, 600 systems operating in early 1940, spreading their wires over 45 states. Well over half a million farms, schools, churches, stores, and rural industrial plants getting electric service for the first time. 300,000 more expected to come on these lines, and new lines going up almost everywhere at the rate of 500 miles a day. President Franklin D. Roosevelt made electricity a reality for rural Americans when he ordered the creation of the Rural Electrification Administration, or REA, in 1935. The REA was an agency that offered low-interest loans to cooperatives or groups of people in rural areas who agreed to sign up for electricity by paying a $5 membership fee. After enough people had joined each cooperative and the loans were approved by the REA, power line construction could begin and the loans would be paid back through people's electric bills. Hoist up the transformer. It means kilowatt hours of electricity. One kilowatt hour will do a week's wash or grind 100 pounds of grain. One kilowatt hour will hoist two tons of hay. Kilowatt hours don't get tired. For the first time ever, rural people could put away their kerosene lamps. Dim lighting and strained eyes were a thing of the past. Now, a simple flick of a switch could light up a whole room. People were in awe of their new appliances. Dirty wood-burning stoves were replaced by electric ovens. Washboards were set aside for washing machines, which did all the scrubbing for you. And trips to the well were no longer necessary. It was quite a thrill to have running water and indoor plumbing in your own home. Next part of the story, starting in 1951, Ronald Reagan comes onto the scene. He'd already been a successful Hollywood actor, mostly B-movies, but he classically played cowboys because he was good at riding horses. Well, as he was entering his Hollywood retirement years, he got picked up by the electric utilities of the United States that formed a consortium of 160 electric utilities from coast to coast. And they hired him because he knew so many actors. He'd actually discovered Marilyn Monroe, by the way. And they hired him to have a TV show. It was called the General Electric Theater. And it was one of the top 10 television shows back when television was being invented as a format and people were sort of experimenting with how to do it right. Ronald Reagan would have pieces of theater performed in front of the TV cameras. Good evening. I am Ronald Reagan speaking for General Electric. Tonight from Hollywood, it is my pleasure to appear in a story entitled The Dark, Dark Hours. Young James Dean, one of the bright new actors in Hollywood, appears with me and Constance Ford plays my wife on the General Electric Theater brought in James Dean, Judy Garland, the whole Rat Pack, pretty much everyone that you can think of who was a star in the 1950s showed up on his TV show. And in between the episodes, they would have advertisements that, that called out the Live Better Electrically jingle. Live Better Electrically, coupled with all these images of people's convenient lifestyles that they could have if they just electrified their home. Ronald Reagan actually had a mansion, it was a demonstration mansion, where it had an electric swimming pool, had electric outside space heaters so he could hold big parties. Inside, all of the cooking equipment was electric. They'd, they'd bring people through and show them how they had these electric servants, is what they called them. It's like a waffle maker or a coffee pot, but these are pretty innovative in the 1950s. And then his lights. Um, he famously had many twinkling colored lights. And you can see in the old black and white walkthrough demonstrations of his house, he'd say, oh, I really wish you could see how beautiful these lights are. They're all orange and green and sparkling. So he invested a lot of personal energy for about 10 years in raising the profile of the all-electric lifestyle. While he was doing the television show, and his off time, he'd be opening up nuclear power plants. That was the clean energy of the 1950s. People actually thought that nuclear power was going to be so big, so successful, they thought electricity would be free, and the only thing you'd have to pay for was the meter. Here's a picture of one of the early air conditioners of the 1950s. 
you can see what a relief it was for people on hot summer days to be able to sit in front of the air conditioner and cool off. In later lessons, we're going to talk about heat pumps. An air conditioner is, in fact, a heat pump. It only goes one direction to cool the air. A heat pump goes in two directions, so you can both heat and cool the air. So the electrification movement continued to grow in the 1960s. Electric utilities hired Julia Child. Her previous career had been making recipes to prevent sharks from attacking mines that had been set in the water during World War II. She was a CIA spy, as well as a master chef at the time. She spent her 1950s era writing cookbooks, and then she got hired by the utilities to teach people how to cook on electric stoves. Her entire career, all the shows you've ever seen her in, she was always cooking on electric ranges. Here you can see some advertisements from the 1960s. For instance, the advertisement, are you cooking the hard way? Where you have a choice between, are you a dinner duchess or are you a galley slave? And you can also see an advertisement here, families love to get together in the wonderful comfort of a total electric gold medallion home. Gold medallions were put on people's doors or there were doorbells or there were clocks in people's homes, ashtrays, cufflinks. They had every little bit of memorabilia you could imagine, essentially, and they're giving it away to people to encourage the all-electric lifestyle. Ronald Reagan stopped being the head of the all-electric movement in 1963. It came out that it had some financial issues that weren't legal with his divorce, and so he walked away from that job and ran for governor of California and won in 1967. When he came into office, though, the state of California had the dirtiest air in the United States really thick smog. And he passed the first Clean Air Act in the United States before the federal government. That was important because ever since then, the United States has let California set its own clean air laws. That's actually why California has been able to support electric vehicles starting in 1990, uh, because our exemption from the Clean Air Act allowed us to set higher standards for vehicles. Starting in 1974, things got difficult for the all-electric movement. OPEC, which is a consortium of oil-producing countries around the world, had boycotted the United States, and they were no longer selling their oil, and electricity prices quadrupled overnight. We are heading toward the most acute shortages of energy since World War II. With the oil embargo, an existing gasoline shortage became worse. Heating oil also was in short supply. This turnpike, usually crowded with trucks and automobiles at this time of the year, is practically deserted. If you want more for your trade, go see Cal. Better deals are never made. Go see Cal. Cal Worthington was a Dodge dealer in Los Angeles. One day we were selling cars like crazy, and the next day, disaster. The oil embargo came along, and... Uh, couldn't sell big cars at all. As a matter of fact, people that had bought big cars were bringing them back and leaving them on the lot. So here, I, I don't want it. I won't be able to buy gas for it. As a result, there was a real push for fuel efficiency around the country. And Reagan passed our country's first energy codes. It's uh, called Title 24. They still exist today. You have to get a building permit with Title 24 printouts with it, showing how energy efficient your building is. Reagan is hoping that this law would also encourage nuclear power plants to be built because he considered them more cost effective. But in fact, when he left office, just the opposite happened. The state started to disapprove nuclear power plants. It's really frustrating for him. In 1976, we got a new president, President Carter. His response to the OPEC embargo and then also another embargo that happened in 1979, uh, that was the Iran hostage crisis. Our position must be clear. I am ordering that we discontinue purchasing of any oil from Iran for delivery to this country. During that era in which electricity is very expensive, he sponsored demonstration homes all over the country, hundreds of them. Most towns had at least one house where you could go to and you could see insulative curtains or a greenhouse on the side of the building to passively heat it and a variety of other energy efficiency measures. All of us must learn to waste less energy. Simply by keeping our thermostats, for instance, at 65 degrees in the daytime and 55 degrees at night, we could save half the current shortage of natural gas. In the year 2000, the solar water heater behind me, which is being dedicated today, will still be here, 
supplying cheap, efficient energy. Because we are now running out of gas and oil, we must prepare quickly for a third change to strict conservation and to the renewed use of coal and to permanent renewable energy sources like solar power. Remember the day, May 6th. 1979, the day the solar age was born. But when Reagan came into power in 1981 as the president, he canceled all those demonstration homes. He wasn't really interested in fuel efficiency. He was starting to push again for fuel production. His vice president was an oil baron, the first George Bush. And he was, of course, still advocating for clean nuclear power. Nuclear power has made tremendous strides in our country in the last few years. Even though we're inclined to think of nuclear power as new, it's important to remember that it has been proved in many applications. The Skipjack, world's fastest submarine, launched in 1958, is powered by an atomic reactor. As are 23 other submarines in the Navy's underseas fleet. There's nothing mysterious about an atomic power plant. Basically, we're just using a new heat source. The standard fuels used in the production of electric power have been coal, oil, and natural gas. In the atomic power plant, we are using a fourth heat source, atomic fission. Atomic fuel has two advantages. It isn't consumed rapidly like other fuels, and it's very compact. For instance, the heat output of one pound of uranium can equal the heat output of 70 tons of coal. 